Okay. So yeah, body. This is a factory camp organization, and we're moving forward. We're at the phase of developing curriculum for the entire content of the steam camp which a lot of people are excited about at this present point the weak point is the power electronics aspects uh, we're pretty strong we're moving forward on the the d3d universe uh, we haven't done circuit plotting actually which would be good to do we're, we're waiting on a manual for the design of the diy arduino it can be milled uh, not milled, but actually circuit etched using the plotter. Uh, two updates on scheduling. So I talked to Michel about potential schedule for his event, and we're looking at late Feb late January. Uh, he was talking about four days. Tonight we have, and why why uh, did I get into that conversation with him? Yep. Chris, you, are you saying something? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't I understand, understand it's in uh, choppy. It looks like it's not just me. Choppy. It's pretty choppy. It's just, you can hear it. I can hear now as well. Um, uh, Freddy, you can hear pretty well? Sorry, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, you can review. <laughs> Michelle, you're squeaking. Okay, um, let's continue. So, one of the coordinators or co-organizers, uh, potential instructors, that Caesar Harada. He's a TED fellow in Hong Kong, and he he's actually pretty excited about an event way because of their holidays in in uh, Hong Kong, there, China area. January is a good time for them. So we're talking about like January 1 through the 9th, which is kind of tight on schedule. But um, we were talking about the first four days at least. And then for the last five days, he's actually a, an instructor at Hong Kong University. He does the Maker, um, not Maker Bay, it's called Maker Bay. I keep confusing Maker Bay another place in Hong Kong. So he's well versed in all this material, but he's um, he's got access to an industrial robot arm, and we were talking about actually about doing some work on open sourcing the industrial robot for mud printing. So he's way excited about that. Um, and right now, it looks like he's quite moving forward on the January one potential to actually invite me out there to run the steam camp. So it's kind of accelerating the schedule, and with discussing running stuff early in the year as well in Europe but for Europe you can't do that in the first week but uh, he was thinking like the third or so week of January to kind of start pushing the schedule up a little bit um, the project that like for the five-day project I think we do still have good access to the Raspberry Pi tablet with phone Yale Fox one of my friends he's a, another TED fellow actually um, and that doesn't really move forward on that as well. The missing link is the power electronics aspect, which means the the controller or the power supply for the motor, uh, a power supply for the electric motor, charger, light dimmer. So kind of like a universal DC power supply that works from 0 to 240 AC and can produce any voltage 0 to 240 AC. Power element where you feed in, like if you're if we're stacking battery packs for um, as in the fourth day we're building battery packs and and did you know that each little six s meaning six uh, of the eighteen six fifty cell packs uh, if it's got six cells in there um, apparently that can produce up to four hundred watts for a very short period. Of seven something like that but those batteries are really high power well the idea there is stacking them a whole bunch of them to to a welder application is quite feasible it also kind of alludes to in a future workshop future steam camps we could be talking about based on the back 
electric motor work, we can be talking about electric vehicles and other applications where it's getting into more serious power. But even right now, at this very initial camp, we can uh, we're definitely going for the the open source welder essentially. Yeah, seeing all the batteries and doing potentially useful welding. So just experiments on that towards product releases later. So in, in summary. Uh, we're moving right forward along with the organization aspect. Things are kind of coming together more or less. Um, I also talked to my mentor who's advising in the background and he said hire a coordinator, a, a senior project manager. So once these steam camps take off, we can really definitely needing uh, admin and organizational support. So I am looking for a senior project manager like right now um, we talked about how do you pay for that well we're gonna get money he's gonna help get money for that and, and then a future team camps will help us pay pay that back but that's definitely um, I'm committed to that uh, simply speaking I need somebody to do all the organization on that there's the incentive challenges other of the operations and there's workshops there's the summer of extreme design build there's a lot of different aspects that go on in a project so we simply need some staff to actually start going and it looks like things are moving forward uh, last thing on the organizational front I published the open source microfactory startup camp so yes we are here November 9th through the 30th to push the products, the productization kits out the door. So that is the D3D Universal 3 in 1 3D printer plus the CNC torch table, which I will actually be building out this week. I spent a little bit of time publishing that event, but if you go to, I want to show you the link um, at opensourceecology.org, it's prominent up there if, if you just go to. On top for the open source microfactory startup camp. Um, we're gonna still gonna talk to a few people who can help out on the enterprise aspect. There's a lot of aspects of that enterprise distribution, productization um, that we can definitely start nailing out and documenting for everybody so everybody can, anyone can start this up in many places because the markets are huge. It's billions, trillions of dollars um, for fundamental production tools and Yeah, my internet is a little slow here, but um, so pasting that in. Okay, my paste was or look at the announcement on that and it's pretty exciting I mean that's the first time we're doing this in our history as far as our startup camp goes we always did prototyping events and build events but nothing that ever focused on enterprise and in, in this time around we're going to do a definite one-third of that event specifically on various enterprise development so you can actually take a look at that link so everything is moving forward uh, and in the background micro house please that's going forward for February we're pressing bricks down there getting machine the machine out uh, last week for early bird registration is next week so people uh, people are saying we actually have like 13 people signed up already uh, that's gonna be a nice event now as far as the meeting here open source micro factory steam camp uh, just some notes on how we communicate so we're talking about using Google Docs and betting them in I cannot hear any hmm. Can you? Michelle, can you hear me? Uh, speed test. Uh, Michelle, you're. you're Uh, let me just restart the internet here. It might be 
some issue with the internet. Let's let me just reboot it. I'm gonna reboot the internet. All right. Okay, it looks pretty good right now. Download. Guys, can you can you hear me now? Wow, thank you. Okay. Oh, good. There's a lot of. Yeah, I'm really good on that. Okay, let's see, phone's making a lot Okay, good, good. Okay, um, you can perhaps review this. I'm not going to repeat all of that, but in summary, we've got Hong Kong and Belgium in planning. We've got the open source microfactory startup camp. November 9th through the 30th product releases productizing the D3D Universal as well as the torch table uh, Moving forward to the meeting. Let's review what we have um, as far as meet just the meeting protocol Three rules one use your log work log. So everything you do Put it on your work log so that the, the reason behind that is it's pretty easy to identify like when somebody's doing work You're gonna be like on a wiki. There's uh, thousands of pages how do you know where to find somebody's work? The easiest way to do it is by name. Like, for example, if you know that uh, Michelle's working on the motor, you'll find all the assets related to the motor on his work log, uh, Michelle log, right? 
Now, there may be other pages like the part library pages or other pages where we put the content as well. But, you know, in case you get lost, go back to the source. So that's a really good way to organize, we found over the years, uh, because it's easy to remember a person's name. And eventually it could be that if you think about how that could be managed, you know, a person maybe can remember up to Dunbar's number, like uh, 200 people. So if I'm the project manager for some project, I could pretty much go into 200 names that I can almost remember and find anything from a very large collaborative team and anyone else can do that so that's a great way to organize uh, content on a wiki uh, just knowing where to find things so unlock embed google presentations that's an easy way where you can clip and paste cut and paste pictures you can comment on the picture uh, we're just i guess talking um mute uh vashko's yeah i just muted you there you were uh hissing um Embedding Google Docs is very effective, so you can manage pictures, annotations, commenting on the actual design, so conceptual designs, everything that we do, uh, put it into those Google, Google Docs, and then put them into your, your log. And a third rule would be make everything public, so like don't, don't do the fancy threads on email, which is private, uh, take that into a doc, and then in an email use a link to that doc to refer to it so that we can everything we do is not hidden in email threads but it's in the public so everyone else can be involved so that's just three basic rules but right now let's get into i know uh, michelle and uh ferdy you've got a lot of updates so ferdy maybe start with uh the update on the circuit plotter so you've got the awesome cad and everything else um ferdy take away where are you what's the status of the circuit plotter yeah, it's um, going quite well. I, I built my little machine. It's, it's tiny, but it, it works well. Um, the, I built the, the pen holder. I, I gave it a little spring, um, but it seems that it might not be necessary to use the spring. Um, I just received my inductive sensor as well, so I will make it work with this one. Do some tests. Um, the, the final big decision for me is going to be the um, horizontal or vertical x-axis. Um, I'm kind of in favor of the vertical one, but um, this should be something we discuss and, and right. just agree on it, because this is going to decide on, on how all of us continue. Right. So, yeah, that's maybe, maybe let's nail this point right now. So if you, I'm sharing my screen, so that's like the embed that you did in your CAD, that's a Ferdy log here. Uh, but yeah, for the pen, it definitely makes a lot of sense to, to do the vertical way of doing it the trouble is and also for the 3d printer yes that could be done that way very effectively we've done that before now for the motor it gets a little tricky because it's really imbalanced like if the motor is a flat pancake so now on the motor if we go to Michelle like I put a little uh, embed of the uh, so this is kind of the, how the motor would look here um, if you take a look at that, and here we have the motor underneath the carriage, which makes it very convenient, a decent mount for that. Um, so, unless we're interested in the con practical considerations, if, if we're trying to do a three-in-one education machine, uh, the practical consideration is are you going to be switching the actual axis in order to mount the different tools well that means you have to take the bolts out um, on this side here because uh, these through bolts here are what attach this horizontal axis right now you have to take those out and instead mount the axis on these two bolts which is some screwing on screwing uh, could be done but uh, ideally we keep everything the same so that's one less thing we have to worry about in terms of transitioning from one machine to the other uh, personally I would favor that uh, the idea of how quick it is to interchange now that with the interchange we're expecting to have a quick connect plug so there's the device it's got some kind of a mount for the universal access carriage piece and it's got some kind of a quick electric mount so that we can disconnect the different tool heads um, so that's two steps you would have to do the, the mechanical connect and the electrical connect to interchange ahead that would be nice as opposed to having to now go to this third aspect 
where you are removing this axis here. Now, if you notice here, if you are removing this axis, you can't go into the particular belt plug hole because if you loosen these bolts here, the belt will come out. So you have to mount it on this other side here. I have to pay attention to that. So I could see complications there, but maybe we can talk just a sec what uh, what other people think about that. Some other feedback. Chris, what are, what's your opinion on the topic? Um, I, uh, I mean, it's a matter of convention, really. I mean, I understand now uh, a little bit more, though, that uh, you're worried about the weight of, uh, of, of the motor on a vertical mounted with all of this, especially hanging off. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can see that definitely being a problem. So it could make sense to mount it on the bottom, you know. Um, I guess when I was thinking about it uh, on a horizontal, I was thinking having the horizontal, and you would mount your uh, your tools on on the top and click into place, and have your tool head sticking up, uh, sticking off the edge, as opposed to mounting it on the underside. Um, but either, I mean, would be would would work. Um, underside for the motor, yes. Oh, yeah. on the top side for the three D printer and for the electronic. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, I see. I see. Okay, so then where's the wiring? The wiring would be um, on the opposite side, or? Yeah, I don't know about the wiring yet. So, I figured it out yet. Yeah. So for a, for a horizontally mounted axis, um, you know, you're either going to have the wiring on the top and, and, be coil and be coiling, you know, like this, or the wiring. Actually, the wiring has to be on the top because if the wiring is on the bottom, it will uh, well, kink and kink uh, coil uh, properly. So I imagine the wiring would have to be either on yeah, the side or on, on the top. Um, yeah, I just haven't seen that many hor uh, horizontal axis uh, for the X for the extruder. Mm -hmm. But does mean, yeah. Michelle, Michelle, you're squeaking. Um, one more comment on the way we did it in Spain. In Spain, we did do it this way. This is mm -hmm. this is how we had it. We well here they're trying on the bottom, but. But we ended up building yeah. it. Oh, oh, the top. Yeah. Um, like printing. Oh, wait. No, actually, we, in this case, we ended up slinging it from the bottom because unless you use the volcano nozzle, the shorter heater block does not reach. Like here, the I reason see. why we put it underneath is we weren't using the volcano nozzle so therefore the the nozzle actually didn't reach below the carriage and that wouldn't work I so see. we slung it underneath uh to start printing I it. See. yeah and then it makes sense because you want the extruder drive gear to be as close to the hot and then your know, nozzle as possible you don't want to have like an unnecessarily large gap so mounting the motor on the underside makes more sense then than on the top uh, yeah it depends on the ex exact yeah, on geometry the um yeah I'm not sure how it plays in this case here, if we're using a simple extruder, I would still put the volcano nozzle on it so we have really good heating um, and faster flow rates, uh, faster print rates possibly. Mm -hmm. So I would still go with the volcano, simple volcano, not super volcano, which is the 80 watt, just the regular volcano, um, as opposed to the short heater block on that. Um, Michelle, what about, uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, you're still squeaking. You are squeaking. Yeah, come come on back in. Um You're squeaking still. Yeah, you're, Michelle, you're squeaking. Um, you're squeaking, you're squeaking. Yeah, maybe... You can try, I mean, maybe maybe try starting your, restarting your computer. You're still squeaking, so... Um,
Can you see my screen? Yeah, now we... Okay, now we can hear you. No, cannot yeah. see your screen yet. Um, no. Oh, wait. Ferdy or yeah. Michelle? What does this mean? Oh, sorry. Ferdy. Okay, Ferdy. Yeah. Um, no, cannot see your screen, but... Um, uh, for Michelle, Michelle, you were still squeaking. Maybe just try restarting the computer and we'll go on a little bit here. Um, but Ferdy, okay, now Ferdy could s somewhat see your screen. Yeah, and just as an example, like for example, the Modella MDX20, like one of the um, typical Fab Lab machines, um, the motor it is not actually the, the difficult part. Like, um, can, you see the, can you see my cursor in the, in the, in the machine? A uh, cursor, can't see your cursor. Okay, so um, like the, the the machine has a little spindle block, which is just the bearings for the for the spindle. Yeah. And the the motor sits above it, like the right. blue thing. Yep. This is where the electric motor is inside. Right. This is quite common. If you look at the other mill, the also the other mill. Yep. The, the spindle bearings are separate from the motor. Right. Um, this is just this is just the bearing for the. Um, for the spindle and on the left side is where the motor attaches. Right. Also, if you look at the motor fab, and the, the motor is in the orange thingy, and the spindle bearings are in the separate the metallic part below it. And making a good bearing for a spindle is a, is a tricky thing. And for example, all those Chinese machines, you know, the typical 2040, like you buy for like 600 euros from China. They come with a, a 100 euro air cool spindle and they all fail because of the bearings. And uh, like if you do it properly, uh, a spindle bearing looks like, the, like, like this image. So it's like at least like three bearings of different types. If you look for eBay and the spindles, and the, the newest thing is that they advertise their spindle setting for bearings. Like actually, um, you just go and uh, bang it, whichever one. Like half of them say, now we have four bearings, and they, and they show pictures of all the bearings. Because this used to be the big problem um, with all the um, with all the cheap Chinese spindles. That after a year, and um, uh, they just used regular and um, um, uh, ball bearings, like with real balls. And they, they all gave up after like a year or something. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese understood, okay, for making the proper milling machine, and you could do it like, like this one, where you just have a, a, a motor that is directly the spindle, but this, this won't last very long. Right. You're going to have a terrible run out, like milling PCB with this one, uh, difficult. Right. Yeah, and I don't think we're looking at... A, a decent grade circuit mill, just very basic uh, functionality right now, more to demonstrate that, oh, here we have our open source motor and we can actually do some useful things with it. So this isn't getting towards the Modella and other kind of performance yet. So for the, the next level, yeah, we'd have to do something more more advanced. Do you know of any, what's the best form, best you would suggest for the the spindle bearing set. Uh, is there a way to do it decently, uh, like DIY, or would you just go with the just an off-the-shelf solution? Yeah, and um, just some um, uh, some um, two of the right bearings, and we, we can have a quite nice spindle just with the electric motor. Yeah. But my point is, like, um, we, we could easily mount the motor in a way that, um, like, what's important is that the the place where you mill is quite close to the bearing. So if the motor sits all the way, like even if it's mounted below the carriage, and um, the tip is quite far away from the from the place where it's attached to the machine, so yeah. this is going to be wobbly. If we um, put it, if you put the the motor um, uh, further up and secure it further down, we're going to have a more stable milling machine than if we put it underneath the, the carriage. Uh, this is my main argument for like vertical instead of horizontal. So with even if we have the pancake motor, do you think we could get better with the, the vertical version? Yeah, I think so. 
And the other argument is that um, if we have um, some parts that are sitting below the gantry and others that are sitting like hanging out on the side, um, this is not going to be a huge difference, but it's it's maybe like um, an, a two inches or three. And um, the, the, you're going to lose those two inches in travel because one tool is more to one side, so you can go and uh, you, have, oh, yeah. you have to go f further back. And then if your next tool is sitting further in the middle, this is exactly the difference is what you're going to be missing in, in the y-axis travel. Yeah. And you can adjust that for each machine, but you would have that would be another adjustment which we want to stay away from. You want to use the same system. That's that's your argument, right? Yeah, I think we should um, just one and then um, stay with it. Yeah. Uh huh. No, that that's another good point about losing travel. So maybe. Um, yeah, we can we can go with a vertical with a vertical orientation. Um, Let's see, Michelle, are you back on, back in? Yeah, you're still, still squeaky. Um, yeah, I guess along the same lines, mounting on the underside, what you'd have to have you lose that much in the Z axis to run the printer. That's true too. That you'd be losing a little bit on the Z. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like we want to go vertical. Yeah, I would prefer it. Yeah, okay. We can offset the weight. I mean, we can... Uh, which we'll, we'll probably want to add some, uh, some rigidity, uh, some extra rigidity for the milling part portion as well. So uh, we might be able to, to, to keep that from being an issue. That would be the tool head on the front with the quick release and then the electronics on the back uh, with the quick electrical connect on the top. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it could be. Let's do it. Uh, Michelle, what, what are, can you speak? Are you muted? No, you're still squeaking. What's different of this time than last time that's happening there because you're squeaking? Without having sound issues, um, yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, go back just a little bit, Ferdy. Um, what's what's your next step on the plotter? And um, actually, I would like one thing that I would like to sort out is the the way we make decisions. And I think it would be great if we, if we all, like, we don't have to um, decide on vertical or horizontal right now. I would propose that we make a model for, for all the variants that we could have. I think GitLab would be a nice way of, of sharing this between us. I already started with Michelle and setting up a way so we can, like, clone the same um, repository from GitHub. And I guess once this is working, I can share this with everybody, so we can all like pull and push from the same repository. Can you still hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, and then we could um, like once we have the same information, all of us, then we could start um, a discussion by using a Google Doc where, where everybody puts their comments. Mm -hmm. So I could put my arguments for a um, vertical um, gantry and somebody could put the ones for horizontal and then once we have like 10 comments for, for each one then I would say you should be the one that then decides okay decision made a gantry is going to be vertical um, and this is the way we continue yeah that's should, yeah basically delaying the design decision finalization uh, for until all the information is in in the front and we have some prototyping done to, in order to make the proper decision right yeah uh, that's actually I'm going through all the team pages looking at, at their at what they're doing and, and commenting like I, I think I commented on a few people's things just for developing the, the habit mm -hmm. but maybe we should have one central and um, Google Doc maybe on the team 
page or somewhere. Okay. So that everybody knows, okay, if there's something to decide, then this is the place where I look for it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start a, that's a good, good idea, working doc on the Steam Camp team page. That's good. And what, you, yeah. what you're describing right now is known as the second Toyota Paradox. Uh, so actually I put that link into the, the te text box. Read that. That's actually quite informative and I do like that. Uh, basically you're, you're not committing, you're doing excessive prototyping until the point where you put everything together so it's definitely consistent with our uh, kind of extreme manufacturing approach where everything is uh, moved forward quite a bit and assembles rapidly into place at the end but, but the initial parts are there's a lot of prototyping going on like more than normal like really excessive amounts so read about that that's an interesting concept I think what we're doing here is somewhat along the lines of the second Toyota paradox that's how they do it in Toyota to be quite successful um, so let me just do a quick embed of that template in there. So just making a, a copy. Um, and Michelle, you're still having issues on a voice. I suppose so. No, or right. Okay, we can hear you now. Oh. <laughs> okay. Strange. Well, uh, to go back uh, to the. The, the carriage, can we, uh, I want to make a comment. Um, the motor doesn't have to be on the side of the carriage when we uh, put it vertu uh, vertically. We can uh, put it under the carriage with a, um, uh, a mounting plate, something like that. We have enough space in the Z direction to, to put the motor under the carriage, I think. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I think there's, yeah, there's different solutions that we can do. Okay, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so we can maybe, I think the thing there is, are you returning back to the motor or are you still doing instructionals on the WebGL? Well, I'm uh, looking into the electronics now because uh, I want to order the parts. I haven't ordered them yet because... Uh, some of the parts in the original um, um, design are uh, obsolete. So I'm looking into the, the technical specs uh, to find um, parts that I can order on a site that has like a European delivery and uh, uh, UA, uh, American uh, shipping. So yeah, I have to figure out uh, what's the best solution. Okay. Okay. Well, well, I'm uh, making progress in that direction. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so I pasted the working document on the team page right now. What's um? So you're you're ordering the parts right now? You're working on that part. Well, um, well if all goes well, I want to order tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you finishing up the WebGL stuff, or are you completely done with that? Uh, no, I have to make the the Git tutorial. Uh, I had a nice talk with Ferdy uh, about that, and uh, I'm looking into uh, using Git on the command line to push complete folders. And the, the downside of GitLab is uh, on GitHub you can use the, the web interface to upload folders, but uh, on GitLab you can't. You, you have to use uh, Hit clients to do that. And uh, there's a hit client in uh, OAZ Linux in the command line. So uh, I'm just figuring out uh, the best uh, the best way to do that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm yeah, making the, the script for the tutorial. Um, what, what Linux are you running? OAZ uh, Linux. Uh, which is based on Ubuntu, Ubuntu yeah. No? Yeah, it's Ubuntu. It's still Ubuntu 16.04. So sudo apt-get install git should should do the trick. Then you can just continue from the command line. Yeah, you don't have to install it's git. Getting... It's it's already installed. It's a uh, standard in. Uh... Yeah. 
Did you, did you get my email? Yeah, yeah, I didn't reply yet. Uh, I was gone uh, practically all day. Um, yeah, I'm gonna uh, post a reply later on. Yeah. I, I Have some questions. Commands, like, it's just four or five commands, and with those, that's actually all you need for, for using it. Uh, well, what I wanted to ask is, uh, can I use your key, or do I have to make my own key for the yeah. SSH? We all have to make our, you have to make a key for yourself, okay. which is going to be associated to your machine, and then and, and the rest is, that's all that's necessary. You don't need to exchange keys. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will try that uh, later this evening. Thanks for the info. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, take a look at. You can click into the doc, the working doc, to start pasting the different uh, design decisions there based on the former documents. Um, I also want to check in. So, Vashko, are you are you doing an instructional on how to build? How, how are you doing? Uh, what's your progress on your side? Uh, learning and any reports. And uh, you have to get unmuted if you want to talk. Yeah, go go ahead, Vashko, uh, if you have anything to, to report. Still muted. Um, just just uh, refresh your browser yeah, it's a bit annoyed, but you can speak go ahead okay um, so um, <coughs> so I was uh, last few days I was working on the can you speak up yeah. here? There's a lot of noise back there. It's very easy to do this well. Can you hear me better now? Not really, it's really muffled. How, how about you guys? Can you hear them? Or? No. 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 Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, there's really it sounds like there's a lot of noise. So maybe maybe um, <laughs> I don't know what what's happening, but uh, I don't really try to get this this thing. Last time it didn't happen, so um, yeah. But uh, anyway, I'm I'm just building the 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 arm and um uh, yeah, the the I think we to uh we need to put it. But regarding the manual, I stick to uh, the, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking notes, and, uh, but I didn't uh, change the layout of the original DC. Okay. I still have some doubts about the art. But I, I think I need to, 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 to continue and to use the other lines and to the other ideas. I don't know if you can yeah. Well, interesting. So, if you look at Vaxel Log, you can see he's building the axis and he's doing a documentation on how to build the right. part of the. Yeah, I'm going to actually move it to the area. Um, so Vashko is, uh, the assignment for Vashko was to document the build of a single axis so that that will be part of the essential instructions that we have during the STEAM camp so one of us doesn't have to do that so we're getting Vashko involved. He's uh, looking at uh, learning enough to run that in, in Portugal, so he's in Portugal. 
uh, we'll see if uh, but that's good uh, the prints prints are looking good there's some minor issues but I'm sure you can fix that what printer are you using to print the parts if you can type in work in progress oh. Yeah. Um, Ender 3 and it prints pretty well. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, pretty cool. So you're doing some pretty good documentation, uh, like documenting all the pictures. I'm looking at your log. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So you're getting some good experience on how this, this all works. So yeah, yeah, good progress. So we've got. All this remote prototyping going on good to see okay uh, but let's let's keep moving here so uh, uh, Ferdy you mentioned so starting with how to make decisions using the Google Docs and shaking down the design decisions so let's do that in a working doc now uh, what else is to be said what's your next step Ferdy on, on the actual plotter part um, I would like um, if, um, if I would like to build Chris's extruder and I would also try to make my own hot end, so um, making the whole extruder just um, in like the mechanics from Chris, and then maybe the hot end um, made by myself. And then I would try um, assembling the motor. I'm really looking forward to building Michelle's motor. Um, let's see. Can you get like before you do that? Can you get a plot? Are some examples of plots with the with the tool chains uh, using your plotter right now? Is that I mean, are yeah. you pretty much ready to plot things? Yeah, I am. Okay, and right now you you just had to redo the spring part, or how how are you doing it? Well, and um, actually, the, the spring is like doesn't make a big difference in uh -huh. keeping it or kicking it out. Um, I would try but my next step would be to make the the z sensor work and then oh yeah oh yeah that's right i could start plotting okay yeah 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 that's that's pretty good um now there was one comment about using so we're using we've been using the eight millimeter distance sensor can you get one of those because you said you've got the four millimeter uh, sensor. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> like I, I read all your documents and the and I, and I read oh yeah it's the 12 millimeter one and I also read, um, I saw some videos from how's this 3D printing guy, guy called, and he was like, yeah, the, the bigger the sensor, the further the distance it can read. So I thought, okay, that's why they chose the 12 millimeter one. Yeah. So I went for the 12 millimeter one, but um, I can order the other one. It's just going to take a few days until it arrives. Yeah, yeah. Um, you can possibly just do the initial testing. Now, the, also the... The wiring can also be just a little different so yeah yeah you can do the initial prototyping with the one you have um you do you have that sensor in pl available yeah, already i got it right next to me yeah um you're using the normally open one no uh yeah yeah i think it's the the normally open and it's a five volt variant like it's much easier to get like the six to twelve volt ones but I, I ordered explicitly a 5 volt one, and then I can just directly wire it into my Arduino now, or into my RAM. The reason the for RAM using the 5 volt one is that you don't need another voltage divider to, to reduce the voltage down to 5, because you can read the 5 directly. If you use the 12 volt version, you have to put use more components to connect it. It won't work straight yeah, out of the it box. It be uh, a voltage divider or a yeah. diode, so I get down to 5 volts without burning my ports in the Arduino. Right, so any, yeah. and we avoid any extra complications if we can, uh, so that this is really seamless to build uh, for people. Because, um, you know, the just a word on the motivation here, I think we're really shaking down all these aspects. Like, if you talk about our former printer, or the one we use typically the uh, with the five axes, uh, it's just almost twice as hard to build. So if you have a super simple three axis printer, and also pay attention a lot to the user interface so it's very easy to build and modify um, that's how i think this is going to get pretty wide adoption as education everywhere like people in schools and uh, everywhere can start using it but it, we have to really pay attention to that simplicity thing so for example the five volt sensor yes otherwise you're you've got more soldering and more complexity so eliminate all the complexity by design 
using parts that are uh, most simply suited for the project. Yeah. Um, with the with the sensor that you have, can you show us some some uh, initial plots? Like maybe plot the OSC logo or something in the next. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> I will, yeah. I will try, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm still here till next Tuesday, and um, then I'm leaving to Bilbao for three weeks, where I'm going to work at another open source project. Um, I will still be online on Thursdays for the meeting. I will probably be focused a lot on we're building a big milling machine um, in FreeCAD, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll share all the outcomes with you. And um, But um, I guess till then I can make a first plot and show you the results. Um, and yeah, um, this is Bilbao Fab Lab. Exactly, it's uh, Spacio Open. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In Spain. Um, okay. Yeah. What's going on? Um, Are you? Is there some kind of a build going on? Or yeah, there's um, there's one guy Happy, like he did Fab Academy in the same year than me, and he's building a big plotter with clay. Like he's already printing. Um, um, vases out of clay maybe a meter high like he's really awesome and um, now he's right now he's building the the next version of it which is using two cylinders for extruding the clay instead of one big one he has two smaller ones so he can switch forth and back between the two of them mm -hmm. this is work in progress right now i guess he's going to be finished once i arrive there and and then we're going to start building the the big cnc machine we already ordered parts for maybe a, a thousand euros which should be there by the time I arrive mm -hmm. then we have one week of just starting to build uh, the, the, the machine then there's the Maker Fair Bilbao which is quite big I expect like a few hundred to over a thousand people um, coming to Maker Fair Bilbao and um, so which is going to be like a big maker meeting um, and um, and then we have another week for um, uh, finishing the machine, so it's um, three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what's your status on? So you're applying for jobs right now. So uh, how's that going? Oh yeah, um, I today um, like after two weeks without a response from Lilium, I accepted the job in the north of Germany, and. Uh, Three hours later, I got the response from Lilium being like, oh, yeah, you should come to the next interview. It's like, damn it, I just, yeah, okay, so no no 100,000 euro job for me. I'm just going <laughs> to do my Fab Lab stuff, which is more fun anyway. Um, when, when are you starting the north, you said in north Germany? Probably in a month, but I guess by the beginning of the year, I'm going to be in the in the north. Okay. Because I'm just looking at the schedule, like if you're going to be pretty busy on um, in Bilbao, um, so realistically speaking, so you can do the the plot with the plotter. Um, are you, does it look like you're going to have time to do some of the other things, or not really? I, I can I can do the plotting before that. Yeah. Uh, b b before Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Now, have you ever done the the actual etching part with uh, the copper chloride? Yeah, but I don't like it because you produce toxic waste. Like milling is nice. I I, I really like milling PCBs. Um, yeah. You you know about the ecological etchant where you save that you don't you don't throw that out, right? It's cupric chloride. Yeah, you just use like a, a sponge, and you, you you can do it with a sponge. You don't even need to bathe it. You just mm -hmm. put it in a sponge, and then you just um kind of stroke it a little bit, um, which is um, like if you're doing um, volume production, let's say you want to make like 50 boards the size of a credit card, mm -hmm. then I would go for etching. But if it's making prototypes, I, I mill them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's see. Let's see if we can uh, yeah, get the get the plotting. So, you, so the tool chain would be using Inkscape to G-code to Marlin, right? Can you do that yeah. that part so yeah. we can uh, integrate that with the rest of the? Yeah, I'm a big. Yep. I'm a big Inkscape fan, and you can get almost anything into Inkscape, and then, and like the easiest way would probably be to just use the G code tools, but um, I will try to find the the, the most user friendly way of doing it. 
Yeah, yeah, go for the... I mean, G-Code Exporter comes out of, of Inkscape, right? That's, you get the G-Code out of that, right? Yeah, G-Code Tools is a, is a plugin for Inkscape. Yeah. And so you can directly from Inkscape generate the G-Code and send it in one go. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so that's good progress. And, and you're bringing, like when you're going to Bilbao, you're going to bring your, your experimental setup of the D3D Universal with you there? Um, maybe not to Bilbao, but I, I'll take it to, to, the, to the north of Germany. Mm -hmm. Where are you located right now? You're in, in... Right now I'm in Munich, in the south. Okay. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Now, the Bilbao work, is that fully open source? Is there any non-commercial stuff going on in there? Or? It's all open source. It's like the typical maker... Well, there, there's, there, there's going to be, I guess, like 50, 60 projects. Mm -hmm. um, uh, last year there was an interesting one doing like um, pellets extrusion and filament making and he's not completely open about it but um, I guess most of the stuff is open source like the, the, the clay printer is open source is there can you point us to some documentation on that the clay printer yeah give me a second and um, that's the um, And just one question on the, the guy who's not so open source about the pellet extrusion, that's not making filament, but just using pellets directly in the extruder? Is that what you're talking about? Um, there's both. Um, there's like one guy that has a, a, he made his own extruder screw, like with a variable pitch, which is nothing that was so easy to get. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. since recently you can buy it on Taobao. And there was another one doing um, a filament extrusion, but I think this one was mostly open source. The filament extrusion one, is that the guy from Germany or that's some other Spanish guys? I, I forgot. Um, I, I think he's Spanish. Is there any online, do you have any online documentation for that part? Or? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 will I can make a little resume of the Maker Fair and all the projects I see. Yeah, I mean the the maker filament making is still it's very interesting to us still. Yeah, that's that's good. Sounds like you'll have fun there. Pretty good. Um, okay. What else do we need to cover? So, Chris, um, Chris, do you want to feed in some updates? Yeah. So I didn't, did not make all that much uh, progress this week um, for some uh, other reasons, but. Um, I, I do have uh, uh, I have some momentum going for this uh, uh, universal tool attachment, so that's what I'm going to try and um, what I'm working on to tie up of the simple extruder design. So I really want to post what I have um, uh, sort of r right n now from Blender to FreeCAD and everything else. Uh, I think I need to get m my authentication logged into the, uh, my into the wiki uh, figured out. I don't think I have an account there, so I wasn't able to add. Uh, I don't think I'm. I'm doing it right, but so I'll, after the meeting, I'll uh, help me if you don't mind that. But um, uh, yeah, so I, I want to also print out Ferdy's uh, letter um, as it currently stands because that's what I'm wanting to focus my attention on the universal tool attachment. Um, I have now all the all the right hardware uh, for it to finish the uh, universal axes, and then yeah, so I want I want to make sure that's compatible uh, with both. And kind of compatible with whatever we decide to do as far as vertical or horizontal. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Let me see, Ferdy. Ferdy, uh, is the final file for the the plotter? You have that in your log, right? The plotter yeah, attachment. But I um, maybe we should do something for like um, like um, Chris had this idea of like putting putting little dots on the prints for distinguishing mm -hmm. them for being like. This is the final version, or this is the, the very, this is the working one, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could um, a, a release numbering or something. I'm, I'm not sure how you normally do it, but um, yeah. I might be uploading stuff to GitHub that is not 
um, that you shouldn't print, like the version. Right, right. right. Okay. I wouldn't recommend printing. I see. Yeah. Okay. So here's how I would suggest doing that, which is what we've been doing: is is uh, the ultimate repository is the wiki part library. So set up a gallery on the wiki, where then you have once again a small picture of the device, and then a link to the file like in FreeCAD typically but if it's not the FreeCAD file just link directly to the thing that's on GitHub or GitLab um, so that we can keep track like this is the circuit plotter v19.10 or whatever um, so that uh, I think there's a page already um, so CNC circuit plotter could be d3d circuit plotter no, let me go back to my log. But in there, we should, for that, that particular machine, let me see where that is. Um, we could link it in the, in the D3D unit. working doc now. Yeah. So I, I put a, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely link it there. But then eventually, by naming convention on a wiki, okay, if this is the plotter, um, I have a page called D3D Universal Plotter. So it's based on a D3D Universal and it's the plotter. So that makes kind of makes sense. I put some material there. So on that page, um, let me share my screen with you guys. Um, so for example, on this page, so D3D Universal Plotter, and we've got your 3D view, your pictures, uh, and so forth. But here we should have a gallery of the actual CAD so that you're not looking like, okay, where to look? Is it the GitHub, GitLab, whatever? No, the wiki is the universal part library venue. So for D3D Universal, we should have a section here called part library. So if you just edit that, um, do part library. Well, should I can see your screen and uh, the only one? Um, not sure. No, I can't see what uh, Marcin is doing. Also. Okay. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying to share. Maybe internet issues. I don't know why, because we got like a hundred meg here. Um, okay, but on the D3D Universal Plotter page, anyway, I just put a part library thing. So, th so the way we should work it is to be able to find those files give it a logical name so the logical name is d3d universal with plotter right and then do like uh here we should have since that's the first version we just call that that but we should actually version it version 19.10 let's say uh so there's no confusion it's not a problem right now as the first version but as soon as we get the next version you want to start adding the version numbers so that's what i would recommend for that and simply link to your gitlab files right there uh, so you don't have to yeah it's it's easy that's what we've been doing the whole time so that's how i can find anything uh, within the project Oops, right I now think I, lost everybody though. I can still hear you um okay so is that is that relatively clear or no can anyone hear me yeah we could hear you yes can hear you um <clears throat> okay so yeah yeah so that's that's about it um that sounds good um so chris maybe maybe we can just um uh, uh when everyone hangs up just we can talk for a little bit you sure you can hear me right yeah yeah i can hear you yeah Yeah, can you guys hear me? Can't seem to, but I'm also. Uh, can you? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Chris, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so is that anything else? Because I did want to, Chris, I did want to just chat with you a little bit after the meeting here. Um, but anything else? It uh, looks like Ferdy, if you could get us to summarize, if you could get us a nice plot of the OSE logo, that would be a great uh, finalization of what you have, uh, which means you have to get the sensor up and running. 
and then we're going to have to modify your design for, because then the sensor is actually going to have to be the the bigger one so there's going to be a minor modification but as long as you have all that on your on your log my last question was there you do have that 30 on your log right the final file that you're using the final file is now on GitLab. Okay. And, um, but um, maybe wait another little bit. Um, should we like um, communicate on the Steam Camp working doc? Yeah. Until I give the go. Yeah. Um, can you can you make it um, uh, accessible for everybody? Oh. It's, um, oh yeah, I see you. Ah, there. But, um, but I can't put comments. Can view? Can edit? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Can you edit now? So latest. Uh, plotter file. Okay, muting Vashko there. Uh, okay, so you guys should be able to do that. Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, we would be in a position where you can s show your work in progress, so just link to that, and then, of course, Put the final, the, the working files in a comment. Like I would do that on the wiki on the D3D Universal Plotter page. Just once you have the final file, you can link to that. But you can still link to files there. The whole point of that is that if you link on a file, if it's on the wiki, there's a version history, so you can just keep uploading the new version, right? So as long as people are clear about that, you should link to the old file, as long as you you have the the file version history so that you can see which is which and when once you do have the final one you can annotate that and make that clear on the wiki that that's indeed the usable usable file um, so that there's no confusion people can access your stuff as soon as you have it so that you're not just working in the dark um, okay you know, we, so maybe um, maybe we do the, the the development on on GitLab and once we're finished we put it in the wiki right yeah yeah but so that some uh, because the wiki is the universal organizing thing, we should still put a link to the GitLab from the wiki, even if it's not finished. So that, you know, if you don't, if you lost the Git, GitLab link, or if you're just surfing the wiki and find that page as a recent change, you'll still be able to get it without knowing, without being on the inside team. So you want to make it externally visible too by people just going through the wiki version history and that people find out because that happens sometimes I'm doing some work and then all of a sudden I get an email saying hey uh, the thing you just did on a wiki is such and such and see if I didn't do that that wouldn't happen and it does result in useful contributions from time to time so it's definitely worth doing um, so so what as you're working on the GitLab just uh, still add that to the working doc as okay this is my working copy and then so, you know, leave a paper thread, paper trail to do the work so anyone can find it, not just the people on the inner team here. Yeah, great. Yeah. Will do. Okay. Um, maybe on the long run, um, could you add us as collaborators to your um, GitLab? So we can, um, yeah. Push um, well, maybe, maybe let's just do that real quick right now. How do I do that? So I haven't played with GitLab uh, much yet. So, okay, so, so if you, I go um, to... you log into your GitLab? Mm -hmm. Maybe if you share your screen, I can I can point you to the right spots. Yeah. Okay, so sharing the screen on a GitLab. So should be able to log in there. I still Why is it? can't see your screen. Okay, um, gitlab.com. You can't see my screen? Yep. Yeah. But I'm on GitLab right now, and it says uh, the address bar is gitlab.com. Yeah. When I go to you OSC, the, you go slash to, OSC. Mm -hmm. You go to your slash OSC, mm -hmm. and then you go um, on the left side, you go on settings. I don't even see that. It just shows. Let me see. On the left side, there should be settings, and then from there, you can go to members. Let me see. Mm, 
Christy. When I go to OSC, I don't see the settings. I see overview activity groups, contributed projects, personal projects. Michelle, I'm going to mute you there. Um, Ferdy, I'm not seeing that. I'm, I'm seeing GitLab on top. There's projects, groups, more. And then going a little bit down, it's overview, activity groups, contributed projects. Where's the settings? Settings is on the upper right. Um, Ferdy, where do I add the people? Can you hear me? Uh, Ferdy, Ferdy, where do I add people? I'm, I'm seeing... Maybe I gotta start a project first. Uh, Ferdy. Can't hear. Um, okay. Ferdy, maybe you can just email me and um, let me know how to do that because I'm, I'm having trouble right now. Um, I'm going to cut and paste a copy of my GitHub page so you can get oriented. GitLab page, rather. Um, yeah, okay. So look, at, look into the working doc. Uh, I put a copy of my what I see on... Oh yeah, and if you go um, on slide number two, I placed a picture where you can see it. Okay, so I put a, uh, I put yours on three. Um, can you see? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is my screenshot. I'm in GitLab, and then there's um, my current project, and then further down there's settings and members. I'm not seeing a. a a screen like yours. Look at page two, and that—that's what I see on mine. If you click on personal projects, oh, maybe you haven't made a project yet. Right. Okay. So, so start a project. So, I need to yeah. start. Which one? The circuit plotter. Yeah, I would just call it M M M D three D Universal. Okay. Now my web is... Okay, I'll do that. My my screen is locking up here. Um, hold on. Oh, this looks like my web browser crashed. Force quit. Okay, um, can you guys still hear me? What I'll do is I'm gonna, yeah, I'll start the project D3D Universal and then uh, get you all, all guys added. And I can simply add you guys or would I need to add you? You can just add us. Um, okay. Uh, like my, um, I, I, I put my... Put your your uh, GitLab names into the work doc so we can I can add you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. I also paste like a little instruction on um, on, page, on slide number four. This is how you would go about um, cloning and um, like once you once we have your repository, we can go in a command line and type um, git clone and then we clone your repo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the beginning, we will only be able to, to our desktop. It, but, sorry, to our, clone it to, to our, our desktop. desktop. To wherever you want to, like in whichever, like if you open your terminal, it's going to be in your home folder. Mm -hmm. And if you say git clone, it's going to create a new folder with the name that you just gave to your um, project. And inside it's going to have all the files that you just put there. But for the moment, you just probably it's just a readme.md. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so if you want to um, uh, upload files to, uh, to your repository, 
I think there's ways you could do it in your browser, but I would recommend you um, to just cop um, just to um, uh, go into your terminal and mm -hmm. git clone your own repository, and it will just download an empty folder basically, and then um, you can copy your files into this empty folder on on your on your computer. And then if you write the second line where it says git status, it's going to tell you, hey, there's new files in your folder. Um, uh, um, oh, cool. Okay. And if you want to add them, you write the second one, the git add, git add colon. Uh, watch out, there's like a little colon in the, in the end, which says as much as add everything that has changed to my current commit. Ah, oh, okay. Then the next line is like an obligatory commit message. So you say git commit minus m, and then in in then you write a, a commit message, which would be in your case it might be um, a first upload of files for my new printer. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, like um, then you can say git push, which is gonna upload the files to your git repository. Okay. That's that's basically all you need to do most of the time. And okay. If you want, if you don't want to enter your password each time, you can add an SSH key to your account. Okay. And um, uh, which would, whoops, uh, which would make things a little bit easier on the long run. Um, uh, right now, you can only clone um, with. In, in, in Git, you're going to see, like if you go to your project, there's going to be a little um, blue button that says clone. And once you click it, it says clone by HTTP or by HTTPS. And mm -hmm. without, the, without genera generating the SSH key, you can only clone by HTTP. Once you have the SSH key, you can clone by, by SSH. Um, I think I put like a little link on explaining how to make. Well, th there's explanations on on GitLab on how to generate an SSH key. Security, Security key. Is, yeah. yeah. Maybe this is easier. Uh, I, I can put some links in the in the working doc. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. No, thank, thank you. you. This, this is good. So we, we can, can actually start using this uh, this way. It's a little. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's that's decent. Otherwise, Otherwise you, you can. can Download directly from GitLab and do it kind of manual. But here you just can update it manually without, you know, just streamlines the process here. It's a yeah. little power power user feature. It's a it's a little bit scary with the command line the first time we do it. But basically, like um, <laughs> um, my, my recipe is very simple. It's you do um, git status for seeing what's going on. You do git clone for cloning a repository. You do git add dot for adding everything, git commit and git push. If anything goes wrong, you just delete the folder and clone it again. That's the idiot proof way of using git. Yeah, so when I do the git clone, it asks me for a username, so that's my password and information from, from GitLab, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Is that, can that be the email or it has to be the other? This, in my case, is just my name. Okay. All right. Sounds, Sounds good. good. That's, that's that's pretty cool. cool. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Uh, anything, anything else? Or we can go. So yeah, continue doc. Um, using the working doc on um, to continue to communicate and go from there. All right. Awesome. 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 Sounds, Sounds good. good. So we'll see you guys uh, next meeting. So let's continue checking in next Thursday at noon time, same time. All right. Okay. Okay. See you guys. And Chris, uh, we'll talk just a little bit right after now. Um, bye bye. Bye bye. So. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yeah. So what's going on on your side there? Mm -hmm. Um, I, de I definitely had a couple of uh, uh, life kind of kind of things that came up over the past week that that uh, was interfering um, in life, but uh, uh, everything's good uh, now. Um, I'm wanting.